Well, Tammy, thank you for having me. Um, my, well, my maiden name is Mary Ann Proper, and that's what I chose to write the book under. So I guess you could say it's my pen name, or I found a brand new way to keep my maiden name in some way. Um, and um, what inspired me to write the book uh, called The Hill, it's a, a, a story from a basket maker's daughter, The Hill. Um, I didn't just call it The Hill because there is so many Vietnam and war stories called The Hill, and I just didn't want it to get lost, but I felt really passionate about calling it The Hill. And basically what inspired me, I don't know if you know or not, my mother was Elizabeth Proper. She was the one who made tonic baskets. She was one of the last basket makers in the area. Um, but actually there used to be a lot of different families that made baskets. There was Stickles, there was Hotellings, there was um, Conquerors, um, Propers, and there's probably a lot of other family names that I'm not even thinking of right now um, that made baskets. So, I always have been a bookworm. When I was a kid, um, I was bullied a lot. And my refuge was going to the library and picking up a book and going into another world. I loved being able to do that. I always dreamed of all, all these stories in my mind of different places. And then when I became an adult, I got married, had children. Well, actually I got married, had a child, got divorced, got married again, had another child, and this one's sticking. He's here. We've been together for 33 years. Um, and I always was kind of hesitant or afraid to write. I had all these great details in my head, but I was afraid to put it down on paper. And then several years ago, I worked for a grant up in Clinton County. And my old boss said to me, um, we have nobody to write this grant. So here you go, you're writing it. If you don't write it, you don't get to keep your job pretty much. And I was like, okay. Um, and I'm sure I'm probably making it sound worse than what it was, but at the time that's how it was coming across to me. So went ahead, took the old bones of the grant, wrote the grant. I was like shaking half the time I was writing the grant. My boss and another coworker did go over the grant before we submitted it. But in the midst of all this here, um, one day my husband and I, we were watching the History Channel and we were watching, um, they were making a comparison with Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars um, and Star Trek. And my husband said to me, well, gee, I wonder what happened to those two guys from Battlestar Galactica. I was like, I don't know, let me look it up. So the one guy didn't really do too much. He was still like out there. The other guy though, Richard Hatch, who played Apollo, Come to find out, he wrote like eight books. Um, he was doing all these um, teaching, coaching, acting. He was doing all these independent projects. Um, at the time, I think now looking back, I think he was probably more cutting edge and ahead of his time than he ever realized when he was alive. So I said to myself, well, I'm gonna reach out to him and I, I'm gonna do writing that I wanna do and I'm gonna write a book. And so two months after the grant got approved, I finally wrote him an email and said, hey, I don't know anything about how to do this. I want to write a book. Actually, there's two book series that I want to do. One is on my family history, and I explained, which is The Hill. This is the first one. And then another one is called Izzy Becker and the Vaudevillians of the Skies, which is something completely different from The Hill, but it's set in the same era and the same time. Um, but this particular one here, The Hill, I wanted to write because growing up, there was um, at one point in time, another book that was written that was very, my mother felt was very derogatory to, to the basket makers and that. It was called Legend of the Bushwhacker Basket and it was by Martha Weatherby and Nathan Taylor. And she felt that it was really far from anything that really happened. And it talked about the people of the hill being barely human and everything. And I just remember hearing all the stories that my mother told me and other family members told me about the hill and our family. So I wanted to write something that was, that would make these people human. So it's based, it's inspired by my grandparents and other family members. There's a lot of fictional characters in here but a lot of scenarios that would have happened back then. There was no law. Everybody had homemade laws, um, homemade laws, homespun laws. That's another way that they would put it. So I just took everything. My grandfather actually bought my grandmother at age 13. 
And I took all of that and everything and it's some of my imagination and just doing a lot of history, a lot of old newspaper articles, a lot of dust, a lot of talking to historians, a lot of talking to family members, um, friends of my mother growing up, people that my mother had a lot of contact with when I was growing up. And I wanted to go back before my mother because I felt it was very, very important to start this out with the hill and then how my grandparents got off the hill. And that's mainly what this story is about. And that's what inspired me to write it. It took a little, quite a while for me to write it. I was actually about ready to pull the rip cord the summer before COVID. I was gonna pull it like around Christmas, like a little bit after, like over the winter and that. And our friend COVID happened. So uh, I took that time to kind of refine it a little bit. Uh, I did come out with it as all self-published. I did all kinds of research on how to do everything. I had professional editors. I had um, professional for a professional formatter, a professional cover artist. I mean, I did everything professional, but I was not going to have, and this is nothing against any publishing companies out there. I was not going to have my book be on a pile of hundreds of other books waiting to be read and saying yay or nay when after I poured my heart into it. I was like, nope, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna follow through with it. Um, and I did it. So, I mean, I'm not a basket ma maker like my mother was. My, I do know how to make baskets. Um, my mother weaved baskets, I weave stories. So she weaved baskets from beginning to end, starting with cutting down trees, throwing them on her shoulder, bringing them out of the woods. I can never see myself doing that. Um, me, on the other hand, give me a pen and paper and a laptop or whatever and some inspiration and I leave stories. So that's what inspired me. So any questions? Do you want me to read a section of the book or? just take place. The Hill yeah. actually takes place in a place that did exist and right outside of West Aconic. Um, it's actually part of the Taconic um, State Park now, the hill is, part of it is. It was a village, it was actually, um, and how the hill came about, it came about, um, you've heard of Livingston Manor, Robert mm -hmm. Livingston. So back in the early 1700s, um, he made a deal with Queen Anne to bring over, um, so she was, Queen Anne was inviting everybody to come to the new world, come to the new world, you know, opportunity for religious freedom, opportunity to own your own land, opportunity for all this and that. And she sent these invitations out. And actually I put some of this actually in the book, the front of the book. And what happened was she sent all these invitations out and what had happened in Germany that winter, and this was like 1710, 1709, 1710, um, the Rhine River flooded, froze, and they were winemakers and they lost everything. And then they were having a new king that came and wanted everybody to become Catholic. If you did not become Catholic, not so good things would happen to you. So they took the invitation. The, I believe the whole village took the invitation. And they started out on foot and made it to England. By the time they made it to England that following year, um, it was fall going into winter. So they had a people where they literally took 10 ships and would put several hundred, I have the exact numbers in here, I don't remember them off the top of my head, in the bottom of these ships. And they locked them in for all the whole winter. People died. Some people lived. The people that lived, they started their journey, came over to the shores. One of the ships came to Robert Livingston's Manor and they were supposed to harvest pine pitch for the naval stores. Well, it ended up being the wrong pine pitch. So now what do you do with all these people you have here? So Robert Livingston had him doing different things. Um, Governor Hunter um, wanted them to, um, the men to go to war. The men that were there did not want to go to war after losing parts of their families or just about all their families. So they refused to do that. And then Governor Hunter in his wisdom kept saying to these people, well, we're not feeding you all winter long. Go out into the woods, come back, to, come back in the spring. He did this for two winters. He lost pretty much all the families, except for five. And then those five families all of a sudden disappeared there. From what I could tell, there was rumors or whatever talk that these five families 
got taken by Indians. They did not get taken by Indians. They went to the hill, which is, as I said, by West Taconic, Lake Taconic. I was even, I guess, um, some of the old buildings are still there, like in the woods or remnants of what used to be. You could see some of them. And the hill actually started flourishing with those five families. And um, it flourished in other ways too. Um, I don't know, I put this in the book um, about, um, because if you have five families for 200 years, what are these people going to look like? They're not going to look very good if you only have five families. Um, I think they took in babies of unwed mothers. And I really have some suspicions about that there. And I found like little tidbits in that. So that's talked about in the book too. And, but the village did start to flourish in that. And they were basket makers from using, gathering fruits and that from making wine back in Germany. And at some point in time, I don't know how, somehow there ended up being a connection with the fruit farmers and people from the hill and the baskets. And that was almost connecting them to the outside world as they would put it to their world. And then things started to connect more and more and things started to happen too. The hill was also the perfect place for other dirty little secrets and other little secrets of other kinds. And that's how the hill came about. But my grandparents so were one of the first, if not the first, to leave the hill. My grandfather bought property. Matter of fact, it's the property where my mother used to live. I don't know if you, anybody knows where my mother's house used to be and um, built a house there, which was not far from the hill at all. It's like the entrance way was right across the road. Um, and that's, and then all the kids went to school in that and that's how they started their lives. And then other people came off of the hill too and followed and did that as well over the years. And I don't know how everybody decided to do it or whatever. I don't know if they've seen them do it and like, oh, okay. We can do this too. That then eventually, though the the owner of that let that property did sell to the state for the for the state park. Yes. About how long did the people on the hill stay isolated by themselves? It they left Livingston Manor in the early 1700s. Um, my grandfather married my grandmother at the at, right at the end of 1913. And then they still stayed on the hill until about 1919, mm -hmm. and they were the first family. But before that, though, they were selling baskets. And there's stories that I've read, though, too, that talked about how um, they, they just didn't come off the hill at all or whatever. And, but then there's stories where I read where they had trucks going up there and wagons and stuff bringing baskets down to like fruit farmers to Hudson because there was only shopping baskets. People wanted shopping baskets. And then they did different kinds of baskets. They did the round split baskets, but they did egg baskets. They did mail baskets. They did bread baskets. They did candle baskets. They did, oh my God, they did hampers. They did um, like laundry baskets, um, baby bassinets. They did, I mean, if there was a use for it, they did it. Um, then there was other baskets that came about after my mother used to do pack baskets. I think she was one of the first, if not the first to do that. And that actually came from an Adirondack pack basket. And my mother would do special orders. My mother eventually did baskets, um, like little tiny baskets, um, little bassinet baskets for girls to put their baby dolls in. Um, but she would not put the um, rockers on them. Um, fireplace baskets too. Some people would put... Um, like almost like little like um like pieces of board underneath them to reinforce the fireplace baskets and then there was gathering baskets flower baskets um so just because they're modified doesn't mean that they weren't a taconic basket or whatever and actually before the baskets were called taconic baskets they were called for, um by the last name of the people rather than people telling proper stickles as i said um there was um Conquerors, Tony Conqueror and West Connick was still alive. His grandfather used to make baskets. He was a basket maker. Um, there was a lot of families that did make baskets though and sold them to 
farmers and that and food farmers a lot of times the food farmers would use the baskets and then just get new ones every year and some of them would leave baskets outside and then they would get damaged for the winter or whatever so but they did all kinds of stuff i found it interesting that um lake charlotte i knew was lake taconic yes but why i mean it's been lake taconic forever and ever for Part of the reason from that on the research that I've done, Livingston, before he sold it to um, New York State, um, did not want it to stay Lake Charlotte because the fact that Charlotte was supposedly some mistress of some family member. So that's the reason why that I've got old time pictures of Lake Charlotte. Lake Charlotte had a whole life of its own. I mean, there was houses there, there was cabins there, there was like higher society people who came from New York City, and this was the weekend cottages and stuff. And my grandfather used to do side work for them too. And then he would take the stuff, like say he put a roof on, he'd take the extra roofing and he'd bring it back to the hill to patch the houses. And you see, I think I even see something about, um, they're like an old, the houses are like old patch, patched quilts in a sense of just odds and ends. And he would bring that stuff back to patch up their houses because they just literally, they started out with like these little shacks, whatever they could build for the time. Um, they were friends with the Indians. They got along with the local Indians. They never had a problem with the Indians. They were never kidnapped by the Indians. Um, but there is, I did a 23 Me. There is not one drop of Indian blood in me. So we didn't mingle in that way with the Indians. And they, the hill existed way past the Indians being in the area. But yet, if my mother used to tell me the orchard that used to be next to my mom's house, she would always find all these old Indian arrow heads there of all kinds. So the Indians had to, were fairly close to the hill. And that would make sense too, because the creeks right down the back, Indians tended to be closer to their water sources and stuff. So, but, um, but yeah, I got an old map of all the different like tribes and like that there, and about where the hill was and like that there. So they were definitely all getting along. So I'd love to know that story. You know how they interact with me. Yeah. That's is anybody other than your mother still making baskets? My mother passed away back January 30th, 1996. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't sure if anybody spoke. And so was she the last one making the baskets? She's the last one in our family making baskets. There is another gentleman. His last name is Klein. I can't think of his first name off the top of my head. And he no, makes it. Thank you. I always it's easy name, but I always forget it. As far as I know, he's still making baskets. As a matter of fact, I looked him up a little while ago and he's got like baskets on art exhibits and everything. He's a phenomenal basket maker. Absolutely amazing. But I didn't, I, I made baskets with my mother, but as I said, I am not the person to throw a log on my shoulder and, and do it, to be honest with you. So. Yes. What kind of food do you make the baskets from? My mom made the baskets with white oak. Um, black ash and hickory. There was another wood she used that, that was used to, and I can't think of the name of it, and they stopped using it because it didn't really exist in the area anymore. It was not existing. Like black ash now is becoming more and more maybe, part of it. Maybe chestnut? Mm -hmm. It was chestnut. I think she actually mentioned it in a couple of um, interviews that she did. I'll have to go back and look and see if I can find it. Yes. So, so my mom would take, first of all, in any of that type of wood, she'd cut out a wedge to see what the rings look like because she was looking for a certain thickness and she wanted to make sure that the tree didn't have like several bad years of growing. And then she would look for, she would also look for a tree that was probably about, um, about four or six inches in diameter, about like this big, not much bigger. Um, Cause then the top layers, the bigger layers are, are, they're not usable. So why kill a tree 
if you're not going to use the whole, that was the other thing too, on the hill, they used everything, they had a use for everything, nothing ever got thrown away, um, and then she would take about, um, from about like maybe a foot, foot and a half from the trunk, about six feet high, and she would use that part of the tree, and then she usually used a horse, sometimes, as I said, she'd throw the tree on her shoulder, um, and then drag the wood down. The rest of the wood, she would take and cut up and she would use it as firewood. Nothing went to waste on that tree at all. So she'd take the bark off or she'd split it down. The oak, um, well, the black ash, what they, she would do is she'd take the bark off and then you've got kind of like that in-between um, first layer that's almost kind of like slimy because it's like, because the bark was on it. She'd take that off and then she would literally take her jackknife and she'd take sections about like that wide. She'd put a slit on each side and with a hammer, she would pound off each layer. And then that layer was used, depending upon the size of the basket, it was used for the braiders, which weed, which was how you weave the body of the basket up. Um, sometimes it would be used for standards, which is the frame on like their smaller, tinier baskets. And then she would use hickory and white oak for like the handles and the hoops and like the bigger baskets. She would take some of that too and make standards out of it. Um, but to make her, to make her handles or ears or whatever, she would like basically like quarter it or like put in eights. She would slip the wood down and then she would just take whatever section and like just basically, um, Leo, you can answer this better than I can because you used to watch her. Um, what's the term? Like she took like the axe yeah. and like split it down. And then she would smooth it out and she would like basically um, take her jackknife and just like carve and make hoops or handles or whatever. And when they were wet, she would take and bend them. And actually she used to use scraps of my uncle's electrician tape or not tape, um, wire, excuse me. And like bend the handle into a shape or whatever. And if it was something that was a straight handle where you would stick it in and she'd carve the ends and then she'd make like that, like that notch there or whatever. And then she'd put the hooks around it and hoop it off. Uh, if ears were almost the same concept except they went the opposite way. And then there was also ears though too for the swing handles. And then she would do the opposite direction in the base. And then that would, you know, swing back and forth. Um, for like the baskets. And she did it on different types of baskets. Some people wanted egg baskets with spring handles. If you were really gathering eggs, that would not be a good thing. Okay. So, but. Some of the baskets, are, the bottoms are flat. Yeah. And then some have little. Raised center. Yeah. Yeah. The Round right. splint is what Actually, she called it. it. What was harder to do? I'll tell you right now, the way she, I like doing the flat bottom ones. Mm -hmm. Um, just because for me, it was easier. That's what you would start out with. Now the round split ones, um, she would take each center and she would narrow the centers. And then she'd do like almost, it always reminded me of like almost like the center of a sunflower. And then of course you got to split the one split because you got to get an odd pattern or whatever. And I didn't know this. Actually, I was talking to somebody. Do you know why the centers were raised in the round split baskets? They were primarily used for fruit. You know why? It was so that the fruit would set so much, so heavy on itself, it would disperse the weight of the fruit. That's the reason why that they would do those. And then there was other ones though too that did not have the race center, like your gathering baskets, your flower baskets, which is absolutely my favorite basket. That's the one that just comes up and looks like a taco. I, that's how I describe it. She made them, she didn't make a lot of them. I wish I had kept one. If I could find one, I would absolutely love to have it. Um, that um, was the round, like the same pattern, but she didn't do the weaving to raise it up. She literally just kept it flat. And because there was a certain way that you could like raise the center of it. Um, so she would keep that flat and do that there. And then there was like a couple of other baskets too that she did more flat um with with like the round bottom basket because it was just it was just better so any questions about the book any questions about anything else any questions from anybody in zoom land <laughs> do you have any 
favorite passages that you I can, I'll read, I will read part of a chapter to you guys, as long as my voice holds out, because for some reason, all of a sudden, I'm starting to lose my voice. So I just took a section of the book, and I almost feel like this was like the turning point of their lives when they, when they met. So I'm just starting in the middle of a chapter here, and I'm just going to read like eh, about four pages. All day I feel tense, knowing Amy will be waiting for me. I don't like the thought of leaving him wondering why I don't show up. What if he tries looking for me? But if I get caught, adult or not, Pat will tan my hide. The smell of biscuits, fish, butter, coffee, strawberries, and sweet churn cream for the berries makes my mouth water when I walk into the cabin. I barely hear Jenny's comment. We would, would have had more berries if Fred hadn't gotten to them. Everyone laughs, including me. After supper, we go outside by the bonfire. Two other families come by for past stories echoing the history of our people. He takes pleasure with each tale, puffing on his pipe in between dipping rhubarb into sugar before eating it. Ginny is eyeing how much sugar he's using in the tiny cup. It would come in handy for a number of babies. Usually I enjoy the stories, but tonight I can't wait for everyone, everyone to leave. The stars make the sky glisten. The sap from the maple log sizzles in the fire, snapping and popping, popping, creating sparks that look like fireflies. The shadows from the lanterns and fire awakens, my, awakens people's senses. No detail is left out in the stories and the leaves, and this leaves them more on edge. All eyes are on path until the last story is spun like a web. Hesitantly, everyone leaves, watching their shadows, making sure there aren't any lurking spirits. We go inside and all fall asleep quickly after a few nips of elderberry wine. I'm afraid to lie in my creaky bed, thinking the sounds when I leave might warn the others to my intentions. I choose to sit on the Wood, the old wood plank floor, so no one will hear me leave. Silence and courage nudge me towards the door. My pounding heart is louder than the creaking noise the door makes when it opens. I freeze, listening for any stirring. There's only loud snoring. I grab a lan lantern, then escape. Owls are hooting along the trail. The crickets serenade the nightlight. I hit the flint to light the lantern. Deeply, I take in the cool night air with the smell of brimstone from the flint. I look around and allow my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The full moon is brighter than usual. The lantern makes my shadow dance and puts me more on edge. The walk to the rock feels longer than usual. Maybe it's because I keep looking over my shoulder, still on edge from past stories. I hear voices and duck behind a big tree along the trail's edge. I peek around to see who's coming. Shoot my ladder. I blow it out, hoping no one saw it or smelt its smoke. The footsteps get closer. The sound of a baby fussing catches my ear. A young mom and an older woman walk past me. They shouldn't be out here at night. Though the shadows may hide them and their secrets, they might also hide predators waiting to pounce. This is an unwed mother bringing her newborn to have someone here care for it. She'll never see her child again. She's strong for not ending the child's life to preserve her family's name. It's mighty hard giving up your child so it will live beyond its first prize. No one looks here to see who gave birth. When people come in from towns to ask about the children for the census, we tell them the name of each child living in each cabin. They always think they're ours. It's hard for them to tell how old someone is when the people don't know themselves. There won't be any unmarked grave for this child. The new bloodline will help prevent bloodlines from becoming too close here. Generations before us started such practices when we learned from the Indians to take people in which helped strengthen the village. Other mothers will take a chance and take the baby to an orphanage 
but from what I hear, there's too many children. Now the orphanage won't take in children over 11 years. Those poor souls fend for themselves on the streets, hoping a family will take them in. Some end up being preyed upon by ungodly souls. Another thing the orphanage will do is farm out children, where the child is put in a home and taught how to earn their keep. When they turn of age, they are asked to stay or are let go if they are if they haven't earned enough, haven't earned their keep enough. Those things are what I don't like about the outside world. The ladies pass by, so I come out, hoping we won't cross paths on the way back. Snap, a branch cracks behind them. Shoot, there's something or someone watching them. The sounds come from a ways down from me. Whatever or whoever it is doesn't know I'm here. But still, nothing comes out to follow the women. I'll backtrack a distance to make sure I can always climb a tree to get away from any danger. Carefully, I make my way out. I freeze when I hear a coyote howling off in the distance. There's a rustling in the bushes. I stop dead in my tracks. No matter what it is, it's small. Quick as a rabbit, a polecat comes out. It's a big one with a big white stripe down its middle, black as night and ready to stink anything up that crosses its path. I'm as still as a tree, no need to get sprayed. Jenny will put me in the shed for a month. I'd rather take on the coyote. The polecat makes its way down the path and back into the woods, good riddance. Walking away, I wonder if I'm one of these babies. My skin isn't as white as most, and my hair is black, unlike the rest of the family. Neither mom nor Pat looks like me. Mom was on in years when she had me. One may think it was time for her to be barren. I've wanted to ask, but such questions aren't spoken. spoken. No matter, the answer for me is there, my parents, regardless. The moonlight and stars guide me along until I decide the women are far enough to safely light the lantern. I turn on the trail towards the rock. In the distance, A.B. is pacing back and forth. He stops. He stops when I clear my throat and he looks to see if it's me. A smile comes across his face that will soon disappear after I tell him the bad news. Nearby, I can swoop. Nearby, I swear I can hear more footsteps. Is it the women from this trail? When I look, I see nothing. It's got to be my imagination from past stories. Aby, someone told Pat about us going to the lake. We want to avoid you finding out. Aby looks upset. Don't worry, there may be another way we can spend time together. Pat and I are going to come by first thing and talk to B. Aby stiffens up. Pat knows B from way back and is offering me up to teach you things so I can learn how to teach others and you can learn. In return, he will be given things in trade. He'll think he's getting the better deal. This is this way. If anything is said, he won't think much of it. AB nods in agreement. Remember, you don't know me. It's been years since we saw one another. Fred, I want to see you again. I put my hand on his shoulder to reassure him. You will. I'll see you tomorrow. I need to get back before anyone notices me missing. Good night. Bye, Fred. As I turn to leave, there is a noise in the shadows. It's a girl. I run towards her and grab her arm. She's tiny with her brown hair in her face. There is a feistiness about her. Amy, do you know her? She's my sister, Mary. What's she doing here? I told her about our adventure. She smiles, Aby's right, you are tall. Mary scrunches her nose at Aby as if to dare him. I wanted to meet you because I have questions and want to have adventures too, even if I'm a girl. Aby sticks his tongue out at her, then she looks back at me. Friend, can girls have adventures? I'm ready to holler, but don't. No, one is having anything except the licking if we don't get back to where we belong. Mary is ready to put her two cents in. I look at her, tomorrow when I come by, you stay away until the end. 
Let's get me to agree about Amy first. Then when you appear, I'll try to get you to come along. Mary smiles. I shake my head, no promises. Mary smiles at me again, like no other girl has before. All right then, I'll do it for Amy's sake. Fred, it's not safe for girls. Amy, yes it is. I walk away. Thank you. I like it, but I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to say something? Um, I know that at some point the, the name of Bushwhackers has been used. And I know when I was a kid growing up here, in fact, there was a 4 H club or something where mm -hmm. they were known as the Bushwhackers. But is that is considered derogatory? That was considered very much derogatory. If you look at some old newspaper articles um, and stuff, and just the way it was used by other people towards people from the hill yeah. and those families, um, it was not thought about as in a very, very good, in a very good way in any way at all. My mother hated that word. That's like you call me the B word or somebody calls somebody the M word or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, no, it was not liked at all. Yeah. But interesting that it was still that it was must have been common enough that they said it was a forage club that was. Oh yeah. I mean, but, just like I mean, certain people are called are called certain things. I mean, yeah. sometimes some people have some words for for, for yeah. city people. Yeah. Uh, no offense to anybody, <laughs> but um, no. and it's it, and it's very common. It's not saying though that yeah. those people from the city yeah. like yeah. those words. Yeah. Um. So, but um. So yeah, and then when that book was written back in the eighties, my mother was fit to be tied absolutely fit to be tied. As a matter of fact, the authors came out to our house, I was a teenager, um, came out to our house and didn't disclose what they were doing. Um, Martha Weatherby offered, you know, said, oh, I'm a basket maker. I, I shake her baskets. I do this, I do that. And she's like, I'd like to buy one of each of your baskets. And my mother's like, okay. And she gets into prices. And that correct, Martha said, oh, no, no, no. You need to charge more money for them than that. And as she's having this conversation with my mother, I'm looking down in this basket and there's a tape recorder going. And, uh, and I'm trying to get to say something to my mother, but my mother's like, go away. She's offering to pay me more for baskets. We can put food on the table. And um, about two months or so later, that Legend of the Bushwhacker basket came out the book and she toured with the book. Um, Martha Weatherby started having workshops on how to make Bushwhacker baskets, aka tonic baskets. Um, my mother never got anything for it. She did it, her and Nathan Taylor did it without my mother's knowledge. And it was a lot of it was old newspaper articles. From what I remember of, the, of seeing the book in that there. And my mother did some um, did some articles on the book and her thoughts on it. And um, they, they made a lot of money. I mean, if you're going to keep touring and doing workshops on baskets and selling your book and everything, you know, and it was, you know, their work or whatever, but my mother always held close to her heart back then, those baskets was a family secret. That was the family's thing. It's like your grandmother's secret recipe that you don't get out. Yeah. Um, well, the secret's out now, so been out. Um, so that my mother felt very hurt and very, very betrayed that they would do such a thing. So. What are you going to do? So, so did they watch your mother make the baskets? So they, they didn't have to watch my mother make the baskets. They already knew they were basket makers in their own mm -hmm. right. And they made shaker baskets, as I said. So as soon as she got, as soon as she got those baskets, I don't think she bought one of each basket out of, of her heart. Yeah. That's my yeah. personal opinion. Yeah. Um, but um, then all of a sudden, those baskets were the ones that were made. She did different ones in the workshop, and a lot of those baskets ended up being in different workshops. So I don't think it was a coincidence. Mm -hmm. so. 
But that's another reason why I did this too, because there was a couple other books that were getting ready to come out and people were thinking about writing and they were more on that perspective. And I wanted to make these people real in your minds. And I wanted, I had insight on how these people or people like them were and what it was like. So I wanted to make it more genuine, even though it's fictional, because it's like just different things in that time. So I made it fictional, um, but it was inspired definitely by the hill. It was inspired by those people. It was inspired about, but they were literally stuck in time. They were definitely stuck in time. Um, and probably my grandfather, and actually my great grandfather was one, a couple of the people that helped with those baskets being made and delivering them and all that there, I think that started to make that change. And it's probably a good thing because Livingston sold that property and it became the state park eventually. So, I mean, they were going to be, and they were in every right, they were squatters. I mean, they lived there for like 200 years. They did not buy that land. Um, they were going to definitely be kicked off. Matter of fact, I think from what my mother used to tell me, some people were, were pushed out of there. So, but can you imagine getting pushed out into like another world that you didn't want to be a part of and all of a sudden, boom, everything's just gone. You know, you were kind of like stuck like back in time and they wanted to stay where they were they liked the way their life was mm -hmm. initially when they lived there it was out of fear because they as i said they were never released from their servitude so mm -hmm. i mean it was out of fear just imagine 200 years of just you know of all that brewing and just going and going and going and thinking that you you didn't fulfill your obligation in some way this was before the United States was the United States. This is before we had taxes. This is before, you know, New York City. This is before so much where it was just wilderness and just not venturing out away from that. I can't even begin to imagine, to be honest with you, how that was for them. And some of those people stayed there. They just, you know, got on in years, passed away and never took a peek at what was beyond the hill. They just stayed there. Mm -hmm. That was their life. That was their world. What language did they speak? Originally German. Over time, I know my grandfather learned English, and I think he was one of the first people that started teaching other people English. Um, but my husband knew somebody, her father still spoke the German. Mm -hmm. And how old? Oh. She's about your age, right? Juanita. Juanita. Mm -hmm. um, so my husband's 56, but your was her father, right? Not her grandfather. And they just did not give up that mm -hmm. language. You could understand them a little bit, but yeah, really, really, really listen to them. Really both your father. There's a lot of stuttering too, mm -hmm. like my my um my uncle Amy, he stuttered. My uncle Jake stuttered. And I don't know if that, what exactly that came from or whatever, but I think also too, sometimes I wonder if the blend of like different languages and I don't know. But originally two different high families. Two. So I don't know. I don't have a third eye. I sound fine. I could write a book. There had to be more than five families. There had to be. My mom was fine. My mom had originally wanted to become a nurse. And her father told her, no, you can't do that. The other thing my, my, grand, uh, my grandfather told her, no, you can't bring a horse. No, that's a man's job. No, you can't. Bad way, baskets, for the most part, was men. Women were not supposed to do it. My grandmother used to take scratch. She was teeny, teeny, tiny. You know, Patty, you see how small she is. Mm -hmm. Tiny like Patty. Um, and she would take scraps of the wood that they didn't use and she would make thimble baskets because she would she always lost her thimble. So she put it around a piece of ribbon or whatever. And and then she also, and other women too, I think, did it too, where they'd give that as wedding presents. There's a couple of stories about that too. And then she'd make like little tiny pink cushion baskets. My mother had, um, as my daughter would put it, grandma had sausage fingers. She had like sausage fingers. My mother had very thick, very heavy hands. There's no way she she could not make a thing. It's just absolutely no way she can make it. I don't even know how I can make it, to be honest with you. So, 
But she had the nesting bed. I always wanted yeah. the nesting baskets. She and then the smallest one was about well, it was like pretty that. small. Yeah. yeah, a lot of cursing went into every one of those baskets she made because she was always fumbling with her fingers on those. And people would want swing handles on those, and she couldn't do it. Best she could do was a lot of them had nothing. They had the hoop, like the the rim. Um, but some of them did have like little tiny straight handles. But she, she <laughs> everybody loved those baskets, and she sold a lot of them, and literally did put a lot of food on our table. But yeah, that's probably the smallest basket. But yeah, she was always fumbling to make those. And she'd always take a sigh before she. It was more. It wasn't so much doing the standards and the braiding it up. It was the like the tiny like the details around like sticking under like the little ends, the standards and that, and like the hooping it off for her was the hardest part. So I used to make baskets so I could relate to that. Mm -hmm. And your hands have to be strong. They have to be strong. You, they have to be very strong. But yeah, you have to be nimble because you have to be flexible exactly. to weave that or to move your fingers certain ways or whatever, depending on the basket that you're making. And not only that there, then you got to haul it down. The stand after they dry out a little bit, you haul it down because then you want you want a good tight basket. Mm -hmm. So you just don't braid it up and then stick the standards on her and then that's it. That's going to make a very loose basket. So yeah, there's a lot of details. My mother used to say on average, it took her 18 hours of basket for basket to make. Mm -hmm. basket. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She'd be working from sun up to sundown easily. Easily all the time. Now Dr. Bahia, who was you remember Dr. Bauer I I heard I heard that name. Oh, he was a wonderful <laughs> family doctor. He'd come to your home and he used to go to the hill. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't pay him money. So they bartered. Mm -hmm. He had so many of your mother's baskets. Mm -hmm. I knew there was a doctor that did go to the hill or whatever. And there is a doctor in this book, but it's it's not I, I put somebody else in there because I just didn't know anything about that person or anything. But yeah, everything I mean, everything back then was bartering for the most part. Anything was trading or bartering. I bet you there was a lot more fruit traded for those baskets than money way back when and vegetables and stuff. Do you have a lot of stuff? No. I have some, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. They it was something you made to sell to pay the electric bill or put food on the table or pay for the horses or whatever. You didn't keep those. It's something that you could always you could always make. But what my mother's last is she they sold like hotcakes, as she used to say. That's one of the things she used to say. They said they, they did. Mm -hmm. There's people that would literally come from all over the United States. I remember her one time trying to figure out if she sold baskets to everybody in every state. And I remember when she finally sold baskets. As a matter of fact, you know, um, as you're going towards West Deconic, there's like that log cabin right before the parkway entrance where there used to be a log cabin there. Mm -hmm. A family from Alaska used to own that. And she sold some baskets to them. She was so happy when she finally sold them baskets because they were from Alaska and she had never sold <laughs> baskets to anybody from Alaska. So, yeah. Does anybody here own baskets? You do? Yep. Any, oh, what kind of baskets do you have? What? Well, but are well, they like close style. in or oh, egg or little ones? A nest? A nest? Big ones. Okay, so oh, is it like a square nest? But she made a lot of different nests. She did oh, nest yeah. and flowering baskets. No. They, she did round splinted yeah. ones. I did the smallest, but some. Mm -hmm. um, some of the spinning with the high basket. Okay, yeah. and then there was a double hand or the double pie basket. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had that had gold. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. actually, I remember, I remember going to Hudson and seeing those baskets, the mail baskets, literally on people's. Yeah. yeah. I actually had mail in it. <laughs> what kind do you have? Me? Yeah, mostly smaller ones. Round, square, um, rectangular. Some are the, I think they're like the flatter ones that you would describe as well, not like the big one that comes out. So are they like like just about that high? Yes. And just like 
like a one, like a perfect square, mm -hmm. or is it more like a rectangle? Like a flower. Or like the, uh, the flower, flower basket, flower like that comes up like a taco with the round, yes. like, like bottom. Yeah, so those sizes. Are I don't think they might have been, they might even be nested. You are very, very lucky. No, she so made a very, very few of those. And somebody brought, I was speaking, and somebody brought uh, a nest in, and they had like six. And I was like, she never made a nest of six. She always made nests, other than like the four little ones, she always made nests of 10, sometimes 12. Yeah. For the most part, now people bought them separately, different sizes, and decided to put them in. So I don't know that that's something different. Yeah. But the nest, though, of the flowering baskets, she's probably she probably made less than twelve of those, but if not less than ten, she made most of them for Barbara at the little with the little gift shop, Starlight Diner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are very, very, very rare. But Barbara was definitely into nest a basket, and she didn't just want the four. She wanted like the bigger nest, and that's where my mother made a lot of those big, huge nests way back when of different kinds. It was the flowering baskets. My mother did like square one. I mean, she did so many different kinds, but there weren't a lot of them of those. The nest of four, there were a lot of those. But other ones now. So yours is very rare, and I'm very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna have to go home and double check. Yeah. Um, what about you? No, I think my I think my grandmother had one. Okay. And somebody else in the family must have gotten. Yeah. Because I remember it was as you said it had the it was round mm -hmm. and it had the raised bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, this, and with the hand a swinging hand on it. Mm -hmm. And swing and do you know why swing handle round swing baskets are better than swing handle leg baskets? A basket's a square flat basket. Oh. It normally has a straight handle. Some people did have them with ears too. But they wanted them more or less for decoration. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, when you go to grab eggs, you want it sturdy. You don't want it moving around. Eggs break very easily. Now, fruit, when you're going up in those trees, you're going to want it to move with you because if not, it's going to get caught in those branches. So you want it to swing back and forth. And like I said, the round center took the pressure. It balanced out the, the weight of the fruit and everything, so it wouldn't get bruised and stuff. So that's the reason why. I don't know if actually that's my well, grandmother's or not, well, but Ray Hotelling, I met with him. He's since passed away. Um, that was his grandmother's <laughs> thimble basket, and that was her, that was a wedding present. I think it was from my grandmother, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, what do you mean? Dime? Dime is next to us. Oh, I thought that was a quarter. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 Very tiny fingers. Yeah. Very, yeah. very tiny fingers. <coughs> if, you go, if you go online too, Marion, they can watch the video of your mom. It's called a basket maker. Yeah. It's like an eight minute video. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, the Roll Up Jansen Historical Society has a whole collection. Of the movie section that my that Leo's talking about, of uh, pictures that I actually never seen before. I had some of them, but some of them I've never seen before. And there's little me in a couple of the pictures, but that's when Jack Oldfield was um, filming my mother making baskets and stuff. The shoulder going out of the woods and actually cutting the tree down. Oh, wow. And the shoulders like splint belly like brain was in the shoulders. And the film, but not the yep. picture. So it's just a little. And the film, they show her. There is so much of that film the now. The axle breaking into pieces. And, There's so much of that film and, now that ended up on, the, on the floor. But I, I really wish back then, you, know, you, you used what you used and then you just got rid of the rest of it. Um, I really wish they had like all that film of all that stuff that she did. They were here days and days, if not more than a week, it might have been more like two weeks filming. And they did at pretty much every aspect. And I, I was shocked that she had done that. Later on, I reflected and was like, wait a minute, this is a secret. Why did you do that? I said that from the beginning of the video, it showed her out in the woods, cut the tree out and it's like, oh my God, yes. So you can see her in action. Yeah, she's like I said, it showed her, like you told her. Splitting it, then it's sitting by the drawers, holding the handle down. Mm -hmm. If you watch the video, it, it's like like eight minutes long. 
Sumner and says, and there's a lot of pictures yeah. though too that shows different mm -hmm. different aspects and stuff of different things mm -hmm. that she did. She would do special orders too. As a matter of fact, in those pictures, there's these big, huge baskets. That somebody wanted these things were probably about as big as this table and about this deep. And she started to do a special order on them, and then all of a sudden, the people decided they didn't want the baskets. She just literally left those baskets sitting there for I can't tell you how long. It's in the pictures on the Roald Jansen Historical Society. Those baskets just never, never got finished. But well, I mean, video, all kinds too. of special. In the beginning of the video. I, I think, yes. And my mother's only advertisement was um, she literally painted a piece of plywood white and wrote on the sign um, baskets, something about baskets being for sale. And initially she didn't even wait for the paint to dry before she put the sign up because she, she we really needed money about Somebody's asking where to find the video. Where it was on. If, I just it on Chrome. I didn't. I mean, I just found it. If you it look up Elizabeth Kroger, yeah. basket maker, because it comes you up can there. you can find it. It usually pops right up. And you, I had it. And it just comes up as um. When you go, it, it says basket maker, and it has colon, then it has Elizabeth Kroger behind it. Then it, then it said that it's like an eight minute video. It's, it's on YouTube too. He did actually five crafters. Yeah. Um, I think it was five crafters. And one guy was the one that, you know, you used to see those big, huge forks and spoons that were like on the wall and they were about like four feet long. He did a um, segment on that. He did a blacksmith. He did my mother. And there was a couple of other people too that he did it's, do. That's where it is. So, oops. Basket maker. If you look up basket maker Elizabeth Proper, is that on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then it's yeah. right there too. It's under folkstreamer.com. So I think yeah, called. that's um, the that's the government. Yeah, yeah, actually, yes, that's right. We're chopping the tree yeah. down. Yep, so there it is. In the beginning, she'll be chopping the tree down. Mm -hmm. so right the beginning of it. So that's where you can find it. But if you just put her name in that and then put down basket maker. She's talking to the through her whole thing. She's I can't believe it. that's her voice. I don't yeah. remember her voice sounding like that. Yeah, well, that's her. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I just remember because even my old, I, even our oldest daughter said, "Is that actually Grandma talking?" Because Grandma didn't sound like that when I knew her. So somewhere along the line, her voice, her voice did change. Um, is there anything else, Tammy? Any questions from the people? I see this. The sound is garbled. Yeah. Are there books for sale there? Yes. Yes. Um, does anybody online have any questions? How much are the books? Books are 20. That includes tax, everything. Just signing. Just signing. Signing is free no matter what. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> are you going to write another book? Yes, I'm in the process of writing a second book on this year. And I got another book series um, that was actually when I was a kid. It's called. It, um, Things that I dreamed up, dreamt up when I was a kid. It's called, it's, as I said, it's completely different. It's called Izzy Becker and the Vaudevillians in Disguise. And it's about, has nothing to do with baskets in any way or the hell. Um, it's about this young girl who her parents, her one parent is from an aristocratic family, and her mother was actually uh, Romanati or gypsy, which I found that is a word gypsies do not like to be called. Um, and it talks about um, all of a sudden her grand, her father's estranged from his family. And all of a sudden her, his father comes knocking at the door one night. And then all of a sudden um, he wants to, wants them to be a part of the family. So Izzy and her brother and her father and her mother. And she's starting to see things that just don't look right about the family. And there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes with the family, her father's side of the family. And then other things start to happen and um, something happens to her father, something happens to her brother. And then she's trying to find them because she's just so close to them. She has this almost amazing life. She's, she's smart, she, her father's an inventor. She helps him to invent things. Um, her mother does performances. She's a uh, trapeze artist. She's an acrobat. She does that with her mother and her mother's side of the family travels and entertains people. She's got the best of both worlds and she's kind of 
even though she's in the world for the longest time, she's not held to that the standards of that time, which is right around World War One, right the turn of the 20th century. And then, as I said, all this stuff starts happening with her family, and then she tries to find things out, and then she finds out once again all these secrets um, about her father's side of the family, and that, and then she goes searching. Um, some things happen to some people and she goes searching for certain people and then she starts finding out other things. And then there's like these other mysterious people that are in her father's life and she starts seeking one of them out because she feels that person has answers. And then she finds out that there's what she may think she wants her life to be turns out may not be that. And then she also finds out about a lot of other things that are going on around her, not only with her family, but in the world at that time. And uh, her brother is like a scientist and inventor, and he tries to find cures for diseases and all this stuff. And you've got all that going on in there and just a lot of, a lot of secrets, a lot of mystery. And then in the end, she actually discovers a whole different world that, um, that she never thought would exist for herself or around her. So I'm trying to tell you something without telling you. Anything. I'm trying to make it appealing. I'm not always good with. So there's a couple more questions. Somebody wants to know what the hardest thing was about writing the book. Believe it or not, the cover. Oh yeah. It is so hard. Or you know what? I really didn't envision. I kind of envisioned in some ways how I wanted the cover, but I really had no clue on this particular cover what I wanted to do. And then I had, I worked with a couple of people on doing the cover and I'm like, nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not right. I had one person who did a lot of copy and paste. It's not good for a cover. Um, and I had a really, really hard time. And then I went back to the original lady and I said, because the original cover to me you know the um, painting with the farmer with the pitchfork mm -hmm. and the older lady. The original picture kind of, in a sense, looked like that. I'm like, mm, no, and I'm like, people are thinking this is a little scary. This is not it. Um, I don't want them to think that this is a horror story. And um, but yeah, all that going back and forth was really really hard. Now with the second book for this year, I know exactly in a sense what I want for the Izzy Becker and the Vaudevillians in the skies, I know what I want, but this, this cover here was like, I felt like I was beating my head against the wall. And I just, I had the hardest time for the cover. There's a lot of, there's a lot of actually covers on my phone that will never probably support it. They just, they won't. So that was the hardest part. And then for those who are online, how can they buy a copy of the book? How can they buy it? They can Venmo me. And I will be more than happy to ship them a copy. Or if could they pick a copy up here? Would that be okay with you? Yeah, not to put you on the spot. Nice. Um, but yeah, if they want to Venmo me and they want me to sign it tonight, and I'll just leave it here. And I always make it out to their name unless they don't want me to. And um, yeah, we can. Then that way, there's no shipping or anything for it. No media. Even though it's discounted with media, it's still shipping, shipping. Are they coming photos, family pictures? No. <laughs> I wish I had a picture of my grandmother or my grandfather. Um, my grandmother, actually, there was a picture of my grandmother, uh, only one that I know of, and she was standing in front of this, or this, there's this big, huge pumpkin, and she was standing behind it. And uh, my cousin Patty, Patty England, who's on here, uh, would always say, I was like, well, what was she going to do with the pumpkin? Well, she was going to carve it up and make pumpkin pie out of it, is what I, what she always told me. Um, so there was that picture. But um, I think I know what happened to the picture, but if what happened to the picture, it's gone. Uh, my grandfather, have you guys ever, um, Francis D. Water, the Grey Riders book, the start of the uh, New York State Police? Well, we are chapter number 21, the forgotten people in that book. Um, and Francis D. Water used to take pictures at, he would do writings, different chapters and like that there. Um, but he did a lot of pictures. And from what I could tell from that chapter reading it, he did take a picture of a lot of people from the hill and including my grandfather. But what happened was I was trying to find that picture. And then I discovered, because in the beginning, nobody wanted the state troopers to exist. 
um, actually three of the state troopers barracks ended up like within a week of one another burning down. And supposedly those pictures were in those state troopers barracks. Mm -hmm. So there are no pictures. So these were just random pictures that were found of people. By the way, yeah. if you put your old people of your family online, be very careful because people can take those and do different things with those because mm -hmm. they're not copyrighted or anything. So, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them out there. Now, so. what era did the children start to go to school? I mean, did they investigate? The, actually, that's the reason why the Ray Riders came to the forgotten people on the hill in 1919, telling them that they had to start to send the children to school. And that's when my grandfather, he had um, bought land like about a few days after that there and started building a house and did start sending the kids to school. So like my uncles that were born around 1900 or 1915 or so, uh, my oldest uncle, Uncle Jake, did go to school from kindergarten on up. Some people tell me that he went to the school in West Deconic. My mother went to the, um, oh my God, the school, Sedan, Sedan Schoolhouse, out past the bus entrance for Lake Deconic going towards um, Ingram in Ingram, oh. yeah. That's where my uncle Harry, my mother, my uncle Grant went to school. But like Fred, Jake, Mabel, and the other kids, I think went actually to West Dakota from what I remember. So that's when they started going to school. I think they probably ended up not going to school more than they did go. So I'm sure if their parents needed them on the farm or whatever, or needed them for something, they just, they didn't go, so. Any other questions? Did your mother sign the baskets in any way? Yes, mm -hmm. she did. She signed her name literally in ink, and I've seen baskets with her signature on it. And then also, too, her and I, uh, Mary Howe, who used to be a teacher at Germantown Central School, bought my mom these brands, and one was EMB for Elizabeth, or EMP, excuse me, for Elizabeth Mary Kroger, and then one was MEP for me. Um, Mary Ann Elizabeth Kroger, Mary Ann Elizabeth Kroger. Um, and she would brand them too. She would literally take out her torch, yeah. heat up the brand, <laughs> and brand the handles of the baskets. Yeah, but she would sign the bottoms of the baskets too. And you can tell a lot of times too, if it's my mother's basket, because my mother always used to take the center of the baskets um more on the raised bottom than the flat bottom and she would literally mark the center of each stanner right in the middle with ink just a straight line across and she'd go back and forth a few times and do it anything else thank you thank, thank you, you very much, much. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Hopefully, if you guys buy a book, you like it. If there's, if you did buy a book or you are going to buy a book, um, let me know if you like it or not, because I want the good with the bad. So far, I've heard, I've heard, oh my God, it's great. Is there going to be a second one? So yes, there is a second one. In